We spent this week looking at wide receivers eligible for the Dolphins to draft in the 2024 NFL draft, but now let's shift our focus inside the offensive line, getting some love, a guard, a tackle, and a center here today on Locked on Dolphins. You are Locked on Dolphins, your daily Miami Dolphins podcast, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. All right, Miami, welcome to another episode of Locked On Dolphins. It is your team every day here on the Locked On Network. I'm your host, Kyle Krabs, a lifelong Miami Dolphins fan, host of Locked On Dolphins, co-host of Locked On NFL Scouting. You can find our shows on YouTube or wherever you listen to your favorite podcast. Tip of the cap to our everydayers, because it is your team every day. We don't just say it, we live it here on the Locked On. On Network, today's episode of Locked on Dolphins is brought to you by FanDuel. Make every moment more. Right now, new customers get $200 in bonus bets with any winning $5 bet. That's $200 if your first bet wins. Visit FanDuel.com slash Locked on to get started. We are giving love to the big uglies up front today. Some of you guys have been asking in the comment section on YouTube, where's the beef? We're talking wide receivers. Where is the trench love? You're getting some here today with three Very popular names uh, for the Miami Dolphins in mock drafts and projecting into uh, this Miami Dolphins offense. Washington offensive tackle, Troy Fatanu. Oregon center, Jackson Powers Johnson, or should I say interior offensive lineman. And Connecticut's Christian Haynes, a second round forecasted player, was a part of my 2024 Miami Dolphins offseason blueprint, uh, who I ultimately ended up picking in the mock draft for Miami Uh, with the team's second round draft selection. We'll profile him on a deep dive here today as well. Who they are, what they profile as, what their strengths and weaknesses are, how they would fit within the current infrastructure of the Miami Dolphins. That is the objective here today on the show. Let's dive into it with Troy Fatanu, uh, offensive tackle. Uh, Junior, 6'4", 317 pounds, actually came in at the NFL Combine at 6'3", and 3 quarters, 317 pounds. Uh, 34 and a half inch arms definitively profiles with that length as an offensive tackle. But when you look at the bullet with when you look at the bio and the bullet points, courtesy of gohuskies.com, Washington Huskies. Uh, he's originally from Nevada. He was rated by rivals as the number 50 offensive tackle, but the number two prospect in the state of Nevada coming out. He played offensive and defensive line in high school, red shirts in 2019. Plays in all four games Washington played in the the COVID season in 2020. Nine games starting three in 2021. Two at left tackle, one at left guard. In 2022, started all 13 games. Played uh, one game as a starter against Stanford at left guard and played the remaining games at left tackle and was named first team all Pac-12 for the second consecutive season in 2023. In addition to being All-American third team on the AP, started all 15 games at Left tackle. The Dolphins, if they're going to make a choice uh, for an offensive lineman that plays offensive tackle, they'd ideally like to know and have the peace of mind that that player can also play guard and be a part of the combination of the best five available players that the Dolphins are drafting. And the fact that Fatano, at least on his resume, has a handful of starts at guard during his career even if he profiles long-term as an offensive tackle, I think puts the Dolphins in a very favorable spot to be, quote-unquote, done their offensive line. Fatanu did not participate in all of the tests at the NFL Combine, but the two athletic tests that he did partake in were the jumps. I remember doing for Dolphins Wire, USA Today's Dolphins Wire, back when Miami was in a different regime. It was the Brian Flores regime. But you looked at the kinds of offensive linemen that the Dolphins tended to gravitate towards and bearing in mind that Chris Greer is a part of that same football brain trust that he is a part of now with Mike McDaniel. And one of the commonalities with a lot of the players that they added was lower body explosiveness. You can Google Dolphins offensive line trends on Dolphins wire, and I'm sure you can find the story, but it looked at like mass And lower body explosiveness were kind of the common themes on all the offensive linemen that the Dolphins invested in uh, early in the rebuild. 
And if I told you that Troy Fatanu at 317 pounds had a 90th percentile vertical jump and a 91st percentile standing broad jump at the NFL Combine, amongst all offensive linemen to come through the NFL Combine since uh, about 2000, uh, that would align very much in that same school of thought. The, the jumps, the vertical jump and the broad jump, you're measuring lower body explosiveness. And explosiveness is probably the number one adjective to describe Troy Fatanu's game. He likes to short set you. He likes to get his hands on you early. He explodes off the ball. He is explosive in space. He's got a ton of range. He's got heavy hitting hands. He is a nasty, nasty mauler. That is a common theme with all three of these players that we're talking about for the Dolphins today in their prospect profiles between Fatanu, Powers, Johnson, and Haynes. They are all nasty dudes. Troy Fatanu uh, has some of the best left tackle tape you will see this season. Now, when I think about weaknesses of Troy Fatanu's game, I think aggressiveness and at times over-aggressiveness can be used against him at times. Uh, and then when he does take deeper pass sets, um, he's usually a short setter. He likes to get hands on and feel you and then use his lateral mobility and reactive athleticism to stay attached to you and use his length and use his hand strength and hand power. But when he has to take sets in space, there are some times where he maybe oversets in relation to his guard. And then that opens him up to two way goes. And then he has to account for more space and he can't be a smothering presence. He has to be a reactive presence. And while he has the athleticism to kind of flip his hips and run you, if he needs to, if you, if you duck inside across his face, he will ride you down inside and wash you through. But you don't have the same arrogance of uh, violence in his game that he carries when he's able to dictate terms to you either in the run game or in um, short set pass protection and getting you in close quarters early in reps. You watch this player in space. <laughs> Whether he's pulling, you know, they'll run toss and he will he will have to get outside and pick up smaller defenders in space and kind of find hunt the trash coming from the inside, sweeping through and kind of clean up the trash to allow his running back to run off of his blocks. Uh, or you watch him as he quickly releases. Washington had a pretty robust screen game that's uh, a parallel to the Miami Dolphins and his, the timing of his releases and how well he can get out in front of plays really stands out. It really stands out. And it makes him, of all the players that I've done and scouted thus far for the 2024 NFL draft, and I'm working on a board, just like I've been working, I worked on a board for free agency. And that free agency board had about 225 total names on it. About 200 of those were not Miami Dolphins. Uh, this board that I have right now has about 60 players on it. And Troy Fatanu uh, is one of the best scheme fits for the Miami Dolphins of any player at any position. Predictively, will he be there for you at 21? That's a very challenging question to answer uh, when you consider you have the Titans as a probable offensive tackle spot, the Chargers as a possible offensive tackle spot in the top 10. And then you have the Jets at 10. Would they go Brock Bowers? Would they go with the third offensive tackle adding, after adding Morgan Moses and adding um, Tyron Smith? I don't know. And then you have teams like the Raiders. They need a right tackle. They have Colt Miller at left tackle. You have the Saints who have an issue with Trevor Penning, their recent first-round draft pick at left tackle, and now Ryan Ramchek might miss the year. That feels like a very logical tackle spot as well. So you're going to have some landmines. Uh, throughout the teens. And it's there's enough depth with offensive tackle where you could see him potentially not being called upon in the pecking order. But specifically for Miami scheme, this is one of the best fits in the draft. It, this, this is definitively, you do not trade out of 21 for this player. And this would be a player, depending on if you could get away with doing pick swaps to get it done or send the player, depending on who the player is, I consider moving up a few spots to get this guy if he got into your stratosphere. He is that good. He is that good. He is a bona fide slam dunk pick for the Dolphins. I am head over heels with Troy Fatano's football game. 
That's the offensive tackle. And then obviously the, the conversation becomes, he'd probably start for you at guard early. And then you would have a succession plan for Teron Armstead in place to transition away from that big money contract in 2025. You'd have a lot of peace of mind. You feel really good. You'd address a need now and a long-term need in a more valuable position. And it would fit the spending trends of the Dolphins. It's a pretty good deal. Him making it to you is going to be the hardest part of that decision. We're going to talk about Jackson Powers Johnson next, who has been a very popular and buzzy mock draft name for the Dolphins for quite some time. And uh, we're going to dig into his game next here on this episode of Locked on Dolphins. Stick with us. Say goodbye to Busted Brackets because FanDuel is letting you bet on every game of the tourney, whether you're betting on a big upset or you're betting on a one seed. It's time to go dancing with America's number one sports book. Right now, new customers get $200 in bonus bets if your first $5 bet wins. That's $200 that you can use on point spreads, money lines. You can even pick who is going to win it all. Just visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and bet on college hoops until they cut down the nets. Jackson Powers Johnson uh, from the University of Oregon has reached a very dangerous stratosphere as it pertains to Miami Dolphins fans and the NFL draft this year, in my opinion, because he's been such a buzzy name for so long that there's going to be a collection, especially fans that, that want to see the offensive line addressed. There will be fans that if he happens to be on the board, at pick number 21 and the Dolphins go in a different direction or trade out of the pick. There's fans that are going to be ticked. There's, there's a lot of fans that are going to be really ticked off, which is why I'm glad that I had the opportunity to finally get around to doing the deep dive of Jackson Powers Johnson. I was familiar with his game. I familiarized myself with the prospects, but in doing prep for free agency and studying all of those NFL players, really doing deep dive players, watching four or five games on college prospect, sitting down, being fully committed to who is this player? What are their strengths and weaknesses? Let me put together like my assessment of the player, my report of the player. That's really only started in the last three weeks for me. I'm totally fine with it. We'll, we'll do the crunch and we'll be totally ready for the NFL draft when it comes. But I, I kind of wish I'd done it sooner, especially after watching Jackson Powers Johnson. So Jackson Powers Johnson is a center from the University of Oregon. He was a consensus four-star recruit, top five center nationally, according to 247 Sports, ESPN, 247 uh, Composite, and Rivals. Uh, it was the top center out of Utah, originally from Utah. He played in 11 games as a true freshman, spending time on the offensive line before spending time at the Alamo Bowl on the defensive line. He played... 126 snaps on offense, 50 on special teams, and 31 on defense. Pretty unique uh, athletic profiler. Started at defensive tackle in the Alamo Bowl. Then 2022 comes, and he plays in 12 of Oregon's 13 games. Made his first start on the offensive line at right guard against Utah. Played 400 offensive snaps. 30, 350 snaps at right guard, 44 at center, 5 at right tackle, and 1 at left guard. So he's moved all over the offensive line. With the prospect of assembling an offensive line being finding the best combination of five players and having positional flexibility, it's nice to know that's in your chamber. 2023 comes. Uh, he is the first Duck and Pac-12 player to win the Remington Trophy as the nation's best center. Fifth unanimous All-American in program history, earned first-team honors from the AFCA, Associated Press, FWAA, Sporting News, and Walter Camp, starting all 13 games for the season at center, opted out of the Fiesta Bowl uh, to get ready for the NFL draft. So, highly decorated player this season. He came into the NFL Combine at 6'3", 328 pounds. He was a standout performer through the first two days of the Reese's Senior Bowl for his work in one-on-ones in, in an environment that we can consistently talk about at All-Star Game time of year. It's difficult to stand out in the All-Star circuit as an offensive lineman just because th those drills are not really geared towards you. And when I watch the tape on Jackson Powers Johnson, there's some things that do stand out that make him an, an appealing player for the Dolphins. With his size, 
he's very difficult to collapse. He has a strong anchor. He is a stout player at the point of attack. Uh, he is not easily moved, uprooted, or collapsed. For Miami, with Tua Tungvaloa and their uh, need to have a certain level of stiffness to the pocket, specifically the interior of the pocket, Jackson Powers Johnson makes a lot of sense. You watch the highlight reel, the sizzle reel. Offensive line sizzle reel for an offensive lineman uh, usually involves a lot of KO blocks, and Powers Johnson has them in space, on the edge, getting out in the space, using good angles, and picking off defenders in space as a 330-pound player. Very special skill set in that regard. And then in the interior run game, working off double teams and climbing up, he's got good jolt with his pads and good jolt with his hands uh, to work double teams to create an initial surge and then get off onto a second defender and, and fit a second defender who's trying to step down into the line of scrimmage. But if you thought that Connor Williams' snap issues were bad, I beg of you to watch the USC game. Watch the USC game in its entirety. Watch the Washington game. Watch the Oregon State game. The snap consistencies for Jackson Powers Johnson make Connor Williams' look like child's play. And I know there's a lot of Dolphins fans who have been on social media as recently as this week asking if the Dolphins drafted Jackson Powers Johnson, would you take Aaron Brewer and would you move him to guard and play Powers Johnson at center? Or would you leave Brewer at center and play Jackson Powers Johnson at guard? The snap issues are, are a problem. There are also a number of false starts as the center uh, that are difficult to reconcile. And for as special of a player as he is out in space, I, I did find it particularly interesting. I did not think he was a particularly dynamic short area player. His ability to, in short spaces, work across the face of a shaded one tech and set the hook. He's a much more favorable angle player uh, to win an initial angle based on alignment. Uh, there's times where we're working the double team and we'll step and the linebacker fires early and we don't necessarily show the short area of foot speed to get off that block and get totally out in front of that linebacker and fit him up. Um, those sorts of things I thought were particularly interesting relative to the, the reputation that he has forged as a dynamic in-space player. And unless you watch snap by snap and you work your way through it, you're probably not going to see it. So I, I was a little surprised to see Jackson Powers Johnson with the reputation that he has and a slam dunk talk pony pick, somebody that if the Dolphins uh, see on the board of 21, they have to run the card and it'd be totally unacceptable and not draft this player to have snap issues and some penalty stuff. And it's his first year playing center full-time. So I, I get that element as well. But I don't know that it gives me any more peace of mind, particularly when Miami's playing, paying Aaron Brewer to presumably be the center and paying him $7 million per season to do so. I'm certainly not drafting Jackson Powers Johnson with his own share of snap issues to come in and be the center and then make the $7 million a year player play a spot that he's less impactful at too. Because I watched Aaron Brewer the prior year in 2022 play guard, and I think he's a much better player at center. So if you're looking for best combination of five, I do not think Jackson Powers Johnson at center is a part of a best possible combination of five if the Dolphins were to add him onto the roster. And I didn't love the inside zone and the short area agility versus the open field instincts and fluidity and understanding of what angles I need to take to, to pick off this second level player. He's got a ton of power. I think he'd be a good player. I think, I think he's going to be a good player. I think he'd be a good player for the Dolphins. I just don't think it should be at center. I would draft him to play guard. And when you get into the conversation of what we expect Miami to uh, invest in early, I don't think center's really in that conversation, specifically after they paid Aaron Brewer $7 million a season to be a center, presumably. I also thought it was a little interesting that, that um, 
some of the insiders who source league sources did not have Jackson Powers Johnson as well represented in the early portions of their player rankings as what the media does. And after watching the tape, I now understand why. There's some questions with this. This is not the slam dunk player you've been sold on. That's not to say he would not be a good player or a viable scheme fit or a player that I would not be fired up about adding to the team. I don't think I'd draft him at 21. He certainly would not be just looking at my board, my draft board over, over here. The players that I'm grading through the lens of grading them for the Dolphins specifically, I have a difficult time envisioning him being among the five best available players at 21. So that's Jackson Powers Johnson. We are going to talk Christian Haynes next here on this episode of Locked on Dolphins. Stick with us. Christian Haynes, University of Yukon, um, is a very fun player. He's He's got that same nasty that both of these previous two players that we've talked about have. And I think that's an important element for the Dolphins to seek as they look to upgrade this offensive line unit. Um, guys with the glass eaters, right? That's one of those scouting euphemisms that, that always makes me chuckle is the guys that uh, are really hard-nosed, uh, they're very blue-collar, they finish plays, they take guys to the ground, they look for big shots, they punish pass rushers and punish jumpers, they will bury smaller defenders in space. Christian Hayes does that too. Uh, this is a redshirt senior player. Uh, he came into the NFL Combine at six foot two and three quarters, another 317-pound player. Uh, so a lot of size. For these three guys, 317 for Fatanu, 328 at the combine for Powers Johnson, and 317 for Christian Haynes. Uh, he was AP All American third team in 2022 and 2023, playing right guard for UConn. That in itself is an accomplishment because UConn is not the football program that it once was when they were in the Big East. And it's not the football program that's on the same stratosphere as Washington and Oregon playing in the Pac-12 championship for a chance to go to the college football playoff. Uh, he originally went to Bowie High School, uh, played three seasons there on the offensive line. He's from Maryland, uh, played two games during his redshirt season in 2018, started at right guard in 2019, started 12 games on the offensive line in 2021, started all 13 games in 2022 at guard, and then all of the games, 12 games at guard this season, starting 49 career games consecutively on the offensive line for UConn. UConn allowed just 12 sacks on the season in 2023. Goes to the Senior Bowl, has a nice showing there. The thing that pops to me about Christian Haynes is in spite of being a 317-pound player, this dude blocks zone as good as any interior offensive lineman in the class. Wide zone, working through a first-level defender to give a kickstand to my offensive tackle to get a piece of him so he could set the hook, and then getting up on a linebacker, he's good. If he's got to push out in the space, he's good. They're going to run, they're, they're going to run pin and pull and get outside, and he's going to have to lead up and get up the field. He can do it. And he can, he's really good on the hoof. He ran a 503 in the 40 yard dash. That's 93rd percentile for offensive guards in the NFL combine since 2000. He runs well. We talk about those lower body explosiveness, those jumps. 94th percentile vertical jump, 33 inch vertical jump at 317 pounds to the NFL combine. It's an explosive player. Now he has his own unique set of limitations. I think he's a guard exclusive player, which certainly hurts his value when you're looking to forecast even Rob Hunt, who they insisted as a pro bowl guard, it's pro bowl guards, pro bowl guard. Well, it never really happened. It probably would have happened this year if he didn't get hurt. And then he goes on and gets $20 million a year from the Carolina Panthers. He came in a league as a tackle. He played Louisiana as a tackle. Christian Haynes, definitively a guard exclusive player. Uh, that, so that, that hurts his profile uh, a little bit more as far as the valuation of the player. I would not be surprised if Miami only gets two cracks at this dude. So some of these mock draft simulators have guard-only players that slide because of positional value. This, this dude is a, a very 
sign, very consistently impactful football player. And he's mean. He's mean. You're watching him. He's locked up on guys, and the ball comes out, and the, the defender starts to turn away, and he rides him into the ground. Oh, you're a safety. You're going to run the alley when I'm pulling out and getting out in front on these perimeter runs. I'm going to bury you. He's got an attitude about him. And I, lo I love that part of his game. They played NC State, right? NC State, Peyton Wilson, standout linebacker. He put Peyton Wilson in the ground. He's slingshotting NC State's defensive tackles, flipping him five yards into the backfield on outside runs, just using his hands to leverage and force him to go the long way around the loop. But when you try and run by me, I'm not done with you, and I'm going to flip you. Re like, really impressive tape for a player of his stature. But he's a better run blocker than he is a pass protector. And he's a guard exclusive player. Kind of pro profiles similarly to what Shaq Mason was coming out of Georgia Tech. And obviously Georgia Tech, they, they run all that triple option, all that kind of stuff. So uh, Mason took a while, but, but developed into a Pro Bowl caliber player in New England before going to Tampa. And then Tampa gets traded to Houston. He's getting $12 million a year, Shaq Mason. I think Christian Haynes can be that kind of player where he's got that squatty build. He's got pretty good length. He's got over 33 inch arms, 33 and a half inches. So he's got significant reach. He's technically got tackle reach at under six foot three. So he's got naturally squatty frame to stay under your pads and play low. He's got a better reach than you think, but not too long, not excessively long where his punch timing is going to be longer and when everything happens quicker inside, that can be a detriment to your consistency in getting hands on defenders. And I think an offensive scheme like Miami's that is predicated around explosiveness off the ball, we want, we want everything to look the same until it's not for the offensive line. More often than not, we don't want to do a true ton of true drop back passing. I think Haynes can develop into a good player in that regard, but early on, a scheme that's going to encourage him be aggressive. Get out the blocks, make it look like run. And if it's a run, then finish the run. And if it's not a run, then gear down, make sure you're flowing horizontally, horizontally and laterally. So everybody creates that displacement. And then you can get your hands on. And then it's just a matter of having reactive quickness to mirror. And I think he has that about his game too. And he has that grittiness about him that he stays sticky. If I were to rank these three players, Troy Fatanu is going to be, I'll spoil this, he's going to be amongst my top eight overall prospects in the 2024 NFL Draft when graded specifically for the Dolphins. Top eight overall player. You do backflips if he's on the board of 21. You do backflips. And you sprint that card in. And a lot of people have had that opinion of Jackson Powers Johnson. He'll be a... I, I think a, an adequate starter early in his career, particularly if he plays at guard. But I think his ceiling is higher at guard than it is at center, and there's more uncertainty about him at center, specifically in Miami, where the, the athleticism of that position, that individual position where you're uncovered more frequently in passing downs, you're more frequently not occupied, so you can release out in the space for their screen game, where there are timing routes where, where we're going to get the ball into our skill players early and try to set up blocks in advance. Whereas remembers that awesome uh, Savan Ahmed screen touchdown that would be if uh, HN hadn't gone out where the center releases and it's like a Texas route screen, those kinds of plays, all of that. I, I think the, uh, the athleticism is there to do it for Jackson Powers Johnson, but the snap issues and the consistency with the execution on a timing-based offense, feels like a big leap to take that I would not be prepared for. He's going to be a first-round player on my grading, but as a guard. And as a result, drafting him at 21 feels like it's going to be a long shot for things that I would strongly, strongly advocate. You never know how the board's going to break, and maybe that would be the case. But for me, that's a he's a guard. Exclusive. And that removes some of the universal appeal of what everybody has been talking for months about. And then Christian Haynes, for me, is a, a firm second-round valuation. I, I think if he's there at 55, if you don't go offensive line earlier, uh, that's a very attractive fit. But the there's more dominoes in front of it that make it less of an obvious decision.
The only obvious decision here is if Fatanu's there, you draft. And if you draft Jackson Powers Johnson, I think it's obvious you don't play him at center. That's going to do it for us here on this episode of Locked on Dolphins. I hope you enjoyed the deep dive into the offensive line. We're going to do more offensive linemen, some defensive linemen next week. Um, going to try and cover as much ground as we possibly can to get you guys ready for the 2024 NFL Draft of Kyle Krabs. Keep it locked in right here on Locked on Dolphins. Enjoy the rest of your day. I'll talk to you all again soon. Fins up.